So today we're looking at what I call becoming all that God wants you to be. Say amen. Becoming what? I want you to know that a lot of times we look at what we do or what we have, not what we have become. Should I say that one more time? <laughs> you see, a lot of times, for instance, if we said, Bible says go into all the world and preach the gospel. Is that not true? It says, this sign shall follow them that they will lay hands on the sick amongst other things and the sick shall recover. They will cast out devils. Is that not true? Now, what we don't talk about is the ones who do those things, what have they become? Say Amen. So we look at it from activity standpoint, not being standpoint. You see, because we look at it from the activity. So um, I can tell, you don't need to put your hands up. Many people do not even have the courage to lay hands on the sick. Am I talking here? <laughs> they don't have the courage to lay hands because they already have a low self-esteem of themselves. They already believe that it's not them that the Bible is talking about. They already believe that it's talking about those who are on the pulpit. True or false? Okay, those people, are, those people are not in church today. All of you in church, you lay hands on the sick. Is that right? Do you lay hands on the sick? Huh? You do? Not yet. When are you going to start? Start now. Say amen. That's the truth. A lot of us don't do it. Why? Because we have separated ourselves from what the Bible says we are to what the world says we are. And in each region of the earth, the climate in each region determines how Christianity is expressed. True or false? Talk to me. Is it true? The climate in each region determines how Christianity is expressed. But I want us to look in the Bible and see what God had in mind when he sent his son to die on the cross. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? What God had in mind is not what the climate on any part of the earth is making Christianity to look like. So I want to challenge you to be one of those odd fellows who will be a different Christian. Who will say I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. Can you say that with me? I am who God says I am. I have what God says I have. And I can do what God says I can do. But you know what he has done? He has already said it in this word. So you are the one to discover it, become it, and do it. Can I hear loud amen? So becoming what all that God wants us to be. I said the key to walking in the fullness of the spirit, expressing all God has for, in store for you, and accomplishing all that God intends for you to walk in his will for you, are all made possible as we endeavor to become all God had in mind for us. Does it bother you when you read the book of Acts? And you see what the early church is like and what the present church is like. Is there a contrast? Talk to me. Is there a huge contrast? So uh, does it bother you that why is it that in the early church they were bold, they experienced the power of God, the fire of God. We still speak in tongues, those of us who speak in tongues. How come we don't see much of the power when we speak in tongues? And those are the things that I would like us to look into. And I'm saying that it boils down to us not recognizing all that we have been made in Christ. Because we don't recognize those things, then we don't walk in them. How many of you know that the presence of God is not something that we just come into only during worship? We should actually live in his presence. Did you hear what I just said? We should actually what? In his presence. Why? Because when we're made righteous, we had bold access. Come boldly to the throne of grace. Is that not true? Now, many of us look at boldly to the throne of grace as things we do when we come together for worship. What we don't know is that he wants us to live in that presence where grief and all the things that befall the world can touch us. Thank you for your thunderous silence, like my wife would say. Hello, somebody. Okay, so let's go on. <laughs> the way you went quiet on me. By the way, before I go, let me just say this, that at the end of this message, I would like to challenge every one of us to be a soul winner. And I want you to win two souls every month. Is it too much? 30 days, two souls. Is that not normal? I said 30 days, two souls. 
a month. Not only win them and say, I won them, then they've gone. No. Win them, disciple them, two, just two. Say amen. Because what I found out is that you are not going to be all that God wants you to be if you don't make the commitment to do what God wants you to do. You see, when I told the young man to start laying hands on the sick, I wouldn't be surprised if the first time he lays hands, nothing happens. But as he commits to laying hands on the sick, he will soon start seeing results. That's the problem with the church, because we only look at the activity. We don't look at who I have become. When you are in Christ, you've become a new creature. All things are what? Passed away. And everything has become new. But because we look at it from activity, religiosity, and not who I am in Christ. I am a new creature. I'm the salt and the light. And that is who I am. Say amen. Okay, so you're going to not only know who you are, you're going to do some things. And you're going to make the commitment to doing them because that's the way to becoming all that God wants you to be. There's a doing side to the becoming side. Say amen. It's not enough to know that you have the righteousness of God in Christ if you don't come to his presence. (laughs) Because the word righteousness means right standing. Is that not true? So if I have right standing, if I'm not doing anything with my right standing, then the consciousness of my right standing will be lost. And that's why I'm going to be sharing with us in this series commitments to doing certain things. Whether or not your senses tell you they are possible, just still do it. If it's in the word, at least, do it. Then you find out that your senses will begin to be retrained and you can become all that God wants you to be. Say amen. If I strive to become all God intends for me to become, then I have, and I have all he intends for me to have, and I can do all he intends for me to do. Say amen. And I said becoming precedes doing. To retain what he gives us lies in our becoming and knowing what we are becoming. Say amen. We all want to fulfill God's purposes for our lives. Am I right? Talk to me. Am I right? But how many of you want to really, are you eager to really fulfill it? Or is it just something that, well, you know, if I just do one or two good things, I will fulfill? No. Because if you look at the examples we're going to be looking at, each person, look at Joseph, look at Moses. All these guys had contradictions in their lives. But they never lost touch with who they are fundamentally, and they were able to restore or change the situation they faced for good. Say amen. amen. Say loud amen. amen. How many of you would like to hear at the end of your life, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the rest of your God. How many of you know that many people won't hear those words? Not because God made it difficult, but because many people are not willing to pay the price. Let me give you a practical picture. You have a low self-esteem of yourself. You find yourself in a climate where everything is done according to your convenience and comfort. So what are you going to do with your low self-esteem? Convenience and culture is, and comfort is a climate determination. You just take Christianity on the side. You do what you can, limited by your comfort and convenience. But your comfort and convenience have been defined by your low self-esteem. So you see how it works. Who you are in the natural, the climate you are in, determines your Christianity. Who you are in the natural, the climate you are in, determines your Christianity. And that's the reason why Christianity seems to be losing that punch that it should have, because who you are in the natural, the climate you find yourself in, who you are in the natural is not necessarily your fault. The way you are nurture, your culture, your people who raised you, that's what they raised you to be. Then the climate you find yourself That's what they are doing. Everybody else, this is what Christians are doing. This is what rich people are doing. This is what poor people are doing. Then you accommodate that, and then that's your definition and your expression of Christianity. The same you was ordained by God to lay hands on the sick. The same you was ordained by God to call the things that be not as though they were. The same you was ordained by God to come into the presence of God, look into the heart of God, and from that presence make declarations to change things on planet Earth. Why is sin prevalent today? Because the church is not stopping it. Why is Satan having his way today? Because the church that should stop it is not doing anything. Why? Natural upbringing, climate, definition of Christianity. So who do you think is behind that? Satan will make sure 
that your natural upbringing has something to do with your limitation. He will make sure that the climate you are under will limit you. So how are you going to now rise up beyond all of that and stop anything he wants to do on planet Earth? So you can see why Satan is not being stopped by the church today. How many of you are still tracking with me? Should we be part of the solution or should we be part of the problem? How many people would be willing to pay the price? That's where the problem is. How many people would be willing to pay the price? There is a climate in, in this part of the world that says do things that are comfortable and convenient for you. True or false? So your Christianity is defined by comfort and convenience. Anything that will place an extra demand on you, it's interfering with your personal space. <laughs> so you leave it alone. But you see, your own natural upbringing has already defined what you're going to do. Now, by the time you put the climate to it, you will not win one. I, if I ask a question, how many people have won one soul to the Lord since they got born again? You will be shocked at how few hands will go up. If I want to make it more practical, how many people have won souls to the Lord in the last one year? You will be shocked at how few hands will go up. Why? Because of these things I'm saying. Your personal upbringing, the climate, your definition. Well, why don't you go into the word of God and say, who did God say I am? Say amen. And what does God say I can do? And what does God say I have? Now, let me begin to do that, irrespective of my natural upbringing, irrespective of the climate I find myself, because those things are not meant to be controlling my life. The word of God is meant to control my life. Can I hear a loud Amen. How many of you would like to take this challenge? <laughs> I know it's not an easy one, but there you go. Hello, somebody. So our base text is Matthew 5, from verse 13 to 16. Say amen. Matthew 5, from what? Verse 13 to 16. Amplified says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, its strength, its quality... How can its softness be restored? Saltness, sorry, saltness. It is not good for anything any longer, but to be thrown out and trodden on the foot by men. You are the light of the world. A city set on the hill cannot be what? Hidden. Nor do men light a lamp and put it under a peck, of, a peck measure, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your moral excellence and praise, your praiseworthy, noble, and good deeds and recognize and honor and praise and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Say amen. So I'm saying that I'm just laying the, in, this is introduction. <laughs> I'm laying the foundation for us to see what this message or the series is meant to do. It's meant to challenge us not to live by our natural upbringing. Not to live by the climate we find ourselves in, but to live by the word of God and by the help of the Spirit. So that we start by saying, who am I? And I, I like to take examples in the Bible rather than just start by telling you, we all know that we're born again. We all know that we're new creatures. But what does it mean? How does that translate into everyday life? How do I become a doer of the word of God? How do I translate what God has made me to become to become an experiential reality in my life? I, I, am I in the house? Am I in the house? So I ask the question, are you your brother's keeper or your brother's killer? <laughs> are you a kingdom agent or an agent of the kingdom of darkness? What are you? Salt and light or conform to the world? How many of you know where salt enters a place? It doesn't matter what the place is like the place changes according to salt. Talk to me. Is it true? If you put salt in water, the water gets salty. The salt doesn't get watery. <laughs> Am I talking here? If you put on the light in the midst of darkness, what happens? The darkness dissipates. The light shines. So what that is telling us is that God did not design you and I to be conformed to the world. God did not design us to be conformed to the world. 
He designed us to influence the world. But why is the church in general not influencing the world like it should? Why does it look like more of Satan's ability is influencing the world? Because the only people who can stop Satan, they are the church. And the only people who don't know that they can stop him, they are the church. So when they don't know, they only wait for him to come and mess up with their personal lives. Then they fight him. But when it comes to national issues or global issues, how many of you have prayed against COVID? And say, COVID spirit, I bind you in the name of Jesus. You have that authority. Say amen. But many people don't know. So that's why we need this kind of message. Say amen. So let's see what I'm saying here. Another thought you were going to, uh, there are many thoughts I'm going to share with you for, for introduction. Then as we go on, I'll take each thought and build on it. Is that all right? I'm going to share those thoughts. One of the thoughts I want to share with you today is, are you a disciple or are you a Christian? <laughs> are you what? Or a Christian? You say, but is there any difference? A world of difference. Jesus will say things like, if you are going to be my disciple, have you noticed that he says things like that? Anyone who will be my disciple should hate his father and mother and love me beyond that. Is that not true? Anyone who will follow me, you should deny yourself, take up your cross and follow me. When you look at those things that Jesus did, he placed a demand on what it means to be a disciple. But in the book of Acts, when they were first called Christians, that's the only time they use the word Christians in that sense in the Bible. Every time Jesus talks about us, he calls us disciples. That's why he said, go into all the world and make disciples. He didn't say, go and make Christians of them. He said, go and make disciples. So I want you to know, first and foremost, that disciple living is sacrificial living. Amen. Say a loud amen. amen. Say a loud one. Amen. So we're going to be considering so many things. But let's, let me try and uh, be more systematic like my wife would be. You know, <clears throat> it's not in my blood. My own is boom, boom, boom. Are you hearing it? Have you heard some boom, boom already? <laughs> okay, let's look at Romans 8. Let's lay some foundation again. It says in Romans 8 from verse 28, it says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God and those who are the called according to his purpose. How many of you are the called according to his purpose? Amen. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be confirmed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among what? Many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also what? Glorified. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with him also freely give us all things? Who shall bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is he who condemns? It is Christ who died. And furthermore, is also reason who is even at the right hand of God who also makes intercession for us. Say amen. Those scriptures summarize the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. Say loud amen. They summarize his ministry pretty much. Pretty much. Because he, he not only died for us. Say amen. He not only paid the price. You see, he paid so many prizes for us. Many of us don't know. And then he sat at the, he sat at the, sitting at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for us today. So where you and I fail or fall short, his intercession can make it up for us. Say amen. So he, that summarizes the love of the Father and the sacrifice of his son. But where does that leave us? It leaves us in a place where we now know who we are meant to be conformed to, the image, Christ, both in character and power. So let me just summarize it for you. God loves you enough to give you his best, his son. Say with me, God loves me. God loves me. How many of you know that we don't major on God's love? Many of us don't know God loves us. We only see our lives as how people see us or how people relate to us. No, God loves you. You're special before God. That's not flattery because he gave his best. Now, when you respond to that, you respond to his son. Now, what his son has done on the cross, he became poor. He took your shame. He took your pain. He took your rejection. He took so many things that you were meant to suffer. These things were attracted to you because of the curse of the law, sin. 
But he took all of that so you can be free. And when he died, all those things died as far as you were concerned. And when he rose from the dead, those things had no power again over you. Can I hear a loud amen? So now he's seated at the right hand of the Father, making intercession for you, so that you can now face life, become all that he has done for you to become, have all that he has given to you to have, and then experience all that he wants you to experience. And amongst that, he wants you to also be his witness so that you can also let others know about him. He also wants you to be his arm. He says, I build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail. I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in uh, uh, whatever. So what that tells you is that he wants you to also be an agent of his kingdom to stop the works of darkness. But how many of us are doing all of that? The average person gets born again, and all they are thinking about is their career, their profession, their family. And if all of that is fine, that is it. Hallelujah. God is good to me. That's all. What about the other things that he wants you to do? You are only majoring on the fringe benefits. What about the assignment? Winning souls. Establishing the kingdom of God on earth. Some people think it's only for those who are preachers. All of us are called into that. That's why I read that place to you. We are predestined, we are called, we are justified, and all of that. It's every believer. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? Every what? Believer. Okay, so we're going to be looking at nature, nurture, culture, knowledge, relationship, farmer, athlete, soldier, and all that when we have the time. But today, let's just learn a few things from our Lord Jesus as our example. Say amen. I said, becoming all the Father had in mind for us, and Jesus is our example of one who fulfilled the purpose of God because he was one who became all that God wanted him to become on planet earth. So I'm just going to look at the scriptures and see how far we go today. In Luke chapter 2, verse 52, and Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. He grew in wisdom mentally, physically, as well as spiritually and socially. The fact that he had to submit himself to all that happened to him. How many of you know that he was with Father God on the right hand before he came to earth? Is that not true? Now he became a man and submitted himself to Mary and Joseph. How many of you think he subjected himself to some things? He did. He subjected himself to some things. The fact that he submitted himself, all that happened, and through all these things, he increased and grew in these areas, underscores the reality that we also need to grow in these areas. Say amen. Do you get my point here? That he wanted to do all that God wants him to do, so he became what God wants him to be. Look at Isaiah 61. When he now grew up, he now began to quote the Old Testament. It says, the spirit of the Lord, Isaiah 61 verse 1. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings. We're looking at the life of Jesus now. To the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and opening of the prison to those who are bound. To proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the year of vengeance of our God. To comfort all who mourn, to console those who mourn in Zion. And uh, to give them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called the trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. And they shall rebuild the old ruins, and they shall raise up the former desolations, and they shall repair the ruined cities, the desolations of many generations. I said our Lord Jesus recognized his purpose in the Father God and went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed of the devil. So what I'm trying to let us see here is this. We want to look at somebody, our Lord Jesus as our example. He came through Mary, is that true? And he submitted himself. When he grew up to the age 30, he went for baptism and he now began the ministry God called him to do. Am I talking to somebody? And when he started, this is the scripture he quoted. He said, this day, this scripture is fulfilled in your eyes. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. You know what I'm telling you here now is that he recognized who God has made him to be so that he can do what God has called him to do. So what should you do? You should recognize who God has made you to be so you can become who God has called you to become so you can do what God has called you to do. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Now, why am I using him as an example? Because we're in Romans 8, we're meant to be conformed to the image of him. So if God has called him to be this, guess what God has called you to do? You are part of him. <laughs> Say amen. How many of you know we are part of the body of Christ? So if God anointed the head 
What do you think he anointed the body with? Is there anything less? No. So if you know what your head, Jesus Christ, was called to do, embrace it. You may have spe specifics amongst the things that he wants you to do. But if you don't embrace the full picture, first of all, it's going to be just another religion. Am I talking here? Am I talking here? So what I'm trying to bring out is this, becoming all. But instead of me just going in to say, let's teach you who you are in Christ. No, I want you to see it from a, uh, a lifestyle perspective. I want you to see the big picture, first of all, then we can go specifically. You get it now? I want you to see the big picture, that the Spirit of the Lord is upon Jesus because God has anointed him. Say amen. How many of you think God has anointed you? <laughs> Hello? How many of you think God has anointed you? Amen. You better believe it. Because if you are in Christ, the word Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. Hello, somebody. So a lot of us don't know it. Are you in Christ? Therefore, if any man is in, is a new. So the word Christ means the anointed one and his anointing. So if God anointed Christ, then that anointing is inside you too. It may not be in its full expression like it was in Christ, but that anointing. That's why he said to them that believe, these signs will follow them. It was because he knew what was going to happen when he rose from the dead that he said, anyone who believes, this is what happened. What he was coding there is that there's an anointing that comes upon everyone who believes in him. And that anointing will produce healing. That anointing will produce deliverance from the demonics. That anointing will produce power that even when they take a deadly thing, it shall not hurt them. Am I talking to anybody here? But you see, why don't we wake up to it? Because the climate. Because our upbringing. What does your upbringing say? It's not for people like us. What does the climate say? <laughs> I don't think I'm qualified because I have enough to deal with in my family, in my place of work. So let, let's, just, let's just live a normal life. No, the normal life should be the anointed life. The normal life should be the Christ-like life. The normal life should be the life that is projecting Christ more than anything else. Can I hear a loud amen? Amen. I said, Jesus Christ recognized his purpose in the Father God and went about doing good healing. In Acts chapter 10, verse 38, he said, how God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with strength and ability and power. He went about doing good and in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil, for God was with him. Say amen. So if we look at the life of Jesus as a person, we find out that he went about healing the sick. Is that not true? He went about doing what God wants him. But this same Jesus now said, I tell you surely, if you believe in me, the works I do, you will do also. Amen. John chapter 14. So what am I saying here? I'm saying that for you to become all that God, you first must understand what God, the big picture God had in mind. God had in mind not just a normal Christianity like it's defined. God had in mind an empowered people who will be agents of his kingdom's expansion and empowered people who will be agents to stop the works of darkness and empowered people who can come before him to his presence, understand, interact, and know his will, be equipped with his power, and go and be his witnesses on planet earth. That's what he had in mind. Do we want God's will to be done in our lives? Say loud, amen. Amen. So that's what I'm getting at here. So I'm, I'm starting by looking at the life of Jesus and letting you know that he is your example. He is the one that you and I are meant to be conformed to in character and power. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. So I'm going to give you just a few scriptures more, then we close it for today. And we'll see whether some of you will come on Wednesday so we can now take one point at a time and break it open. Say amen. Say it loud, amen. So look at John 14, 12. I assure you most solemnly, I tell you, if anyone steadfastly believes in me, he will himself be able to do the things that I do. And he will do even greater things than these because I go to the Father. And I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as representing all that I am. Can you see that? 
what we are becoming, representing all. So what many people don't know is that when you say in the name of Jesus, you are not just using a name. You are saying, I am standing to represent all that he is by saying in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> I'm sure some of you never thought of it like that before. Yes. Look at what, that's what it says in Amplified Translation here. It says, verse 13, and I will do, I myself will grant whatever you ask in my name as representing all that I am, so that the Father may be glorified and exalted in and through the Son. Yes, I will grant, I myself will do for you whatever you shall ask in my name as representing all that I am. Say amen. All you ask in my name as representing all that I am. <laughs> so, let me give you some scriptures that you can say, what can I take home with this? This is take home for you. These are all thoughts I want to share with you, but this is take home now. I said sacrifices are involved in the pursuit of purpose and becoming all we are meant to be. Let's look at Psalm 50 verse 5. Psalm 50 verse 5. It says, gather together to me my sins, those who have found grace in my sight, those who have made a covenant with me by sacrifice. Everybody say by sacrifice. You see, what many of us don't quite catch, amongst other things, I hope I'm not just hitting at different points. <laughs> okay, let me be more systematic. Let me try. <laughs> it's not possible. Forget it. Just hear me out. <laughs> and God will grant you understanding. Say loud amen. So I'm saying that, how am I going to become all that God wants me to be? I started by challenging your thoughts. Introduction. I started by saying things that will make you start thinking otherwise about what you have already perceived to be who you are. That's why I talked about your natural, your climate, and definition of Christianity. Now we're looking at the life of Jesus, and I started by saying that the anointing that he has on him, that anointing potentially lies inside you. Amen. And he went about doing good, healing all that were oppressed. There were many things that we can talk about his healing ministry. We're not going to spend all the time doing that today. So now we want to look at the element of how do I position myself to experience what God has in mind for me. And I'm bringing you to another thought that the secret of your walk with God is in making the necessary sacrifices for his covenant to be established in your life. How many of you know there is a sacrifice involved? Gather together to me, my saints, those who have made a covenant with me by what? Sacrifice. A lot of us would rather think of the sacrifice of Jesus as the sacrifice that was made on our behalf, so we don't need to make sacrifices. You don't get it. That he made the sacrifice has made us acceptable to the Father. But for us to function with God... There are sacrifices involved. Say amen. So let's look at one of such sacrifices. In Romans, is it Romans 12? Yes. Romans 12, from verse 1. It says, I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God, to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, representing, your member, presenting all your members and faculties as a what? As a what? Say it loud. Say it one more time. So that means that if I'm going to present my body holy and acceptable before God, I must have the mind that I am a living sacrifice. You see, a lot of us do not want to make any sacrifices where God's kingdom is concerned. And so because we don't make the right kind of sacrifices, we don't experience the things that he has made available. Let's read on. It says... Um, Presenting your body as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable service and spiritual worship. So when you present your body a living sacrifice, you're going to deny it of the things that it wants because you want it to be holy. You're going to deny it of whatever because you want to be pleasing to God. Say amen. How many of you know that if you just leave your body according to all the dictates that your body wants, you won't be pleasing to God? Instead of you praying, you'll be sleeping. 
Say amen. <laughs> Instead of you reading the Bible, you'll be watching TV. <laughs> Instead of you doing anything that would be pleasing to God, you would rather do what your flesh, your body wants. Is that not true? So there is an element of sacrifice. Okay? Now, verse 2. It says, and it's called your reasonable worship. It says, this is your reasonable service. Verse 2 says, do not be conformed to the world, this age. See what I've been talking about? Fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves what is good, the good, acceptable, perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in God's sight for you. Say amen. So if you're not going to be conformed to this world, it's not going to come just by saying, I'm a Christian. No. You are the one going to now labor to renew your mind. What does renewing your mind entail? It's not just knowing the Bible. Knowing the Bible is the beginning of it. It's actually doing the Bible. Minds don't get renewed just because you now have knowledge. Knowledge can argue with knowledge. <laughs> oh, well, you know, this, this, no. It is the doing of the word that renews the mind. Can I hear loud amen? So do not be conformed to this world, but be fashioned after and adapted to its ex. And that means be fashioned after, do not be conformed, be fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial cause, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind by its new ideals and its new attitude. In other words, you will have to retrain your mind to have new ideals and new attitudes. Are you getting it now? New ideals. And look at what uh, COVID-19 has done to our ideal. It has told all of us that watching from home is safer. Talk to me. And the Bible says that you should not forsake the assembling together of one another. How many of you know that there's a corporate anointing that you can't get if you sit on your sofa at home and watch on TV? It's not the same. It's not the same. But look at the coming together. I look at the book of Acts. They came together. Now, don't get me wrong. I like the fact that we can Zoom meetings and do Zoom trainings. I love that. But we should not take that to replace our coming together. Can I hear a loud amen? amen? We should not take that to replace our coming together. And it takes sacrifice to come together. And that is why sacrifices are involved in obedience to whatever God's word says. Say a loud amen. So here he's saying that we should not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of our minds. The world has a way of molding the church in such a way that the church will be less and less effective. And we need to wake up in every generation to say, no, it shall not happen in my time. Amen. How many churches tell their people to lay hands on the sick? How many churches tell their people to cast out demons? <laughs> Jesus said, this signs will follow you. Do it. But you know the secret of doing it? You must make the decision to do it, otherwise you won't. That is where the changing of the mind comes from. If you don't make the decision to do it, it won't be done, and your mind will not change. You can hear the word, you can hear that you can do it, but until you do it and keep doing it, nothing changes. So, what am I bringing up here? I said sacrificial living is the secret to enjoying the full impact of the sacrifices of Jesus Christ for us. The world wants to mold us into its mold, using our selfishness, our pride, laziness, or convenience to keep us out of God's ways for our lives. That's what the world wants to do. Jesus told his disciples to deny themselves, take up their cross, and follow him. A true disciple is one who is willing to fulfill all the conditions Jesus gave for following him. So, I'm telling you about sacrificial living. Let's look at one of the conditions Jesus says in Matthew 16, from verse 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to be my disciple, let him deny himself, disregard, lose sight of, and forget himself and his own interest, and take up his cross and follow me. Cleave steadfastly to me, conform wholly to my example in living and, if need be, in dying also. 
For whoever is bent on saving his temporal life, his comfort and security here, shall lose it eternal life. And whoever loses his life, his comfort and security here, for my sake, shall find it life everlasting. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his life, his blessed life in the kingdom of God? Or what will a man give as an exchange for his blessed life in the kingdom of God? For the Son of Man is going to come in his glory of his Father and his angels, and then he will render account and reward every man in accordance with what he has done. Say amen. Say amen. So are you ready to be his disciple? I think that's the challenge that we need to face today. Are we ready to be his disciple? Are we ready to make the sacrifices for his will to be done on earth? If the answer is yes, then you're welcome to church. Say amen. If the answer is I want to think about it, then think about it between now and Wednesday and show up on Wednesday. (laughs) But if the answer is a straight yes, then I can tell you very clearly that heaven's power has been waiting for you to make that decision. Heaven wants to respond to you according to that decision. A lot of us don't know it. Heaven's power has been waiting. The day you make up your mind that I want to do the will of God, then God makes up, not that God makes up, he has already made up his mind, then God's power is now available at another level for you to experience his power. That's what it is. So the day you make up your mind, it's not enough for me to say, well, I go to church, I'm a Christian. No, I'm a disciple of Jesus. I have sacrificed and I'm willing to sacrifice whatever it takes. Why do you think people don't lay hands on the sick? Shall I tell you? Your reputation is at stake. If you lay hands on the sick and they don't get healed, aren't you going to be a bad name? Talk to me. That's why you're not doing it. Your reputation is at stake. (laughs) <laughs> that's the truth you, and you want to keep the convenience, the comfort the, you know oh, everybody's nice mm, mm. yeah yeah everybody's nice your reputation is at stake so you won't want to do anything he said. so that's where the sacrifice is involved you sacrifice that reputation and see <laughs> thank you for your thunderous silence think of anything he wants you to do there is a price to pay There is something that you have to deny yourself of to do that. And if you don't do it, that's it. That's the limitation. So I don't want you to take this message from a condemning side or making you feel guilty of, oh, I've been guilty of not doing this. No, that's not the spirit I want you to take it with. Why? Because that would be part of your upbringing, your low (laughs) self-esteem. Anyway, that's another matter. So the way I want you to take this message is, I thank God for all that God has done in my life. And I thank God for what he has been doing. It's now time to move into another level of maturity. Another level of sacrifice. And another level of experiencing God in practical terms. Don't take this message from the angle of, I've not been, I've not been, I'm guilty of, oh, I'm not good enough. My mind is not to make you feel like that. So don't take it from that angle. Take it from the angle of, okay, becoming all God wants me to be. Now I know that I'm a, I'm a, I'm a disciple. Say amen. Now I know there are sacrifices involved. And I also know that there's an anointing inside me. And if I'm going to let that anointing flow out, I must be willing to make the sacrifices. And whatever it is, whatever price I need to pay, I can tap into the help of the Holy Spirit. So he will help me. Oh, that's the other side we didn't talk about. The fullness of the Spirit. Say amen. He will help you. He will teach you. He will give you the wisdom of God. And with that, you can fulfill all that God wants you to fulfill. But are you ready to be a disciple? Or are you already a disciple? Say, I am a disciple. I am willing to make the sacrifices. Obeying God is the highest priority. In my life, I live in his presence, I live by his power, and I'm extending his kingdom. Lord, grant me the wisdom, grant me the grace to be an extender of your kingdom wherever I am. 
to bring souls into your kingdom, to make disciples of other people, and to experience your power in my life. Let your fire burn in me. Any motive that is not pure, any tendency that doesn't glorify you, let the fire of God burn it up. I want to please you, Father, with everything in me. Wherever I've made the mistakes, I receive forgiveness. I receive purity of motive. I will serve you. I will love you. And you will make me to be all that you have ordained for me. I am who you say I am. I have what you say I have. And I can do what you say I can do. By the stripes of Jesus I am healed. When I lay hands on the sick they shall recover. When I cast out devils the devils have to go. Because I have been translated. From the kingdom of darkness. Into the kingdom of God's son. I belong to the kingdom of God. I demonstrate the power of God by faith in the word of God. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for giving me your name. I believe in your name and the works that you did. I will do also. Because whenever I ask anything in your name, you said you will do it. I count on you to do it. In Jesus' name I pray.